Welcome to this video on registration. My name is Mark Jenkinson and I'm going to be talking to you about EPI distortion correction and how that interacts with registration. EPI, if you remember, is the pulse sequence that we use in order to acquire functional and diffusion images. So this is equally relevant for functional and diffusion imaging, though most of the examples that I'll be giving will be related to functional imaging. When we've got a functional image, or as I say, a diffusion, where we've got an EPI image, and we want to register that to our structural image, and then ultimately to our standard space, we've got a few more problems than we would have if we just had a structural to standard registration or a structural to structural registration problem. And that's because the EPIs have distortions and they have loss of signal, which we need to be able to correct for. And that's what the EPI distortion correction is all about. So registration of EPI is more tricky than other things because the EPIs suffer from both signal distortion, that is the geometric distortion where signal is not where it should be, and also signal loss, which means that we just have some areas where we've just lost signal, we end up with black um, patches. Because the field that we were, would be working at, that our magnetic field, which should be nice and uniform three tests or whatever our magnet is, needs to be equal everywhere in order to get good imaging. But actually, it's not exactly equal everywhere. And when we are doing EPI imaging, we're particularly sensitive to changes in that. And so that's what causes these problems. And hence, we need to try and solve some of that. And we can do that. We can unwarp some of the the geometric distortions and we can take account of the signal loss but we're never going to get that signal back and in order to do that we need a field map and that is as i said a special acquisition here's just an illustration of of what you can see so the top row shows you a structural image and i've highlighted two different areas the one in red is an area where we see a lot of signal loss so inferior frontal and temporal lobes are where most things happen and you can see here in the the functional image on the second row how much signal is lost there these images are well aligned so you can see in, in the anatomical structural image at the top there was a reasonable amount of signal in that red box in the epi there's very little and the bottom row in the blue box you can see what happens in an area where actually it's not that the fact that the signal has disappeared the signal's actually just been pushed into the wrong location and so that's another characteristic thing that we see. And again, means that it doesn't match well with our structural image above. The reasons that we have these deviations of our B0 field, that is our sort of constant three Tesla field or what the field that we would like to be constant, is because the behavior of air is quite different to the behavior of the rest of the tissues within the head from a magnetic point of view. And that means that actually at all the air tissue faces, we have disturbances of that magnetic field. And those field changes are the things which cause the problems. They don't cause problems in structural imaging because we actually set up the sequences so that they're not disturbed in that way. But that's also part of the reason they take so long. It takes minutes to acquire a structural image. We need to acquire functional images in seconds. And one of the sacrifices that we have to make, one of the trade-offs, is that we are more sensitive to these problems. The field map image that I've talked about is actually an acquisition we can get which measures the field at each point in the brain. And that's what we're showing here. You can see for most of the brain it's a fairly uniform gray, which means that the field is nice and constant. That's what we want. And then in these areas, which are in the inferior frontal parts, we see deviations away from that. And that manifests in these EPIs as either geometric distortion, things are shifted away from where they should be, or signal loss. And this video at the bottom shows us the signal loss evolving over time. So we've actually got lots of different images which we've made a movie from. And none of those have geometric distortion in them because it's a very special sequence which doesn't have noticeable geometric distortion, but it has different levels of signal loss. And you can see where that signal loss Occurs. It is in these frontal, um, inferior and inferior temporal areas. We're normally somewhere in the middle of that movie in terms of how much signal loss we're going to experience, but it will depend exactly on how you've set up your EPI sequence.
So we're going to use our field maps to predict how much distortion we, we're going to get. We actually already know the direction that that distortion is going to happen. That's going to happen along the phase encode direction, which is one of the directions that your operator will set up when they're actually planning the scan that, that is happening. So they already know what that direction is. Typically it's anterior posterior, not always, but often. And so we can use a field map to estimate the size of the distortion at each location. So we're going to get a magnitude of the spatial distortion at each point, and we're going to know what direction that is along. We also can use it to estimate the amount of signal loss. And because it only takes a few minutes to acquire a field map, typically something like that one and a half to two minutes, it's really worth doing because it massively improves your registration quality, as we'll see later in the talk. And you need a new field map every time you've got a new session. So if your subject has come out of the scanner and they've gone back in, they will need a new field map for that particular session because it's very dependent upon the orientation and the location of the head within the magnet. We're going to use our field, as I said, to predict how much uh, warping there is, and we can actually undo that, as you can see in the unwarped example at the bottom. This is a very good example because actually most of the time there's a combination of signal loss and geometric distortion, and we can't recover that signal loss. So we don't always see that things um, go all the way to the edge of the brain like they do here. Quite often we restore some of the areas, but not all of them. But nonetheless, we are moving all of the features, all of the structures which we have got good signal for back into their correct locations because it affects things all the way down to the, to the ventricles. So we're going to use it to geometrically improve the location of structures within our scan, which is really going to help with the registration. But it is not going to fix the loss of signal. Signal which is lost at acquisition is gone. It's gone forever. We can't get it back. There are fixes that you can do at the acquisition level to try and minimize that. But once you've acquired the image, that's it. So in terms of what we can do in the analysis phase, we can't fix that. We also are not going to worry about the very subtle changes of the field map which occur when the head moves. It's very much a second order effect to what we're correcting for here. The static change in the field from the constant level is much bigger than any changes which we induce when we're moving the head. But we are going to use the field map to calculate the amount of distortion and to unwarp it, as you can see at the bottom, as well as calculate the amount of signal loss and use that to de-weight areas of, in the registration. That is, we're going to say, okay, we know where the signal loss has occurred, so ignore that when you're doing the registration because we know that we can't get a good match. Field map acquisition, as I said, only takes a minute or two. There are various different types of acquisitions that you can get. Gradient echo with two different echo times is the most common, but asymmetric spin echoes also occur. Another variant which is very popular now is blip reversed B equals zero pairs or B naught pairs. They are actually part of what you would normally get in a diffusion experiment. So if you're getting diffusion data, you will definitely be getting B naught images. And if you blip reverse, that is you change the sign of the phase encode direction, then actually if you get a, a few more of those, then they work very well. And they're an EPI based acquisition. But EPI based acquisitions on their own, which do not occur as blip reversed pairs with the diffusion um, sequence, that is the spin echo EPI, they are a problem because actually they have the worst quality in the areas that we care about most. They suffer from signal loss and distortion themselves. And so the exact areas where we want to get things right, they are not as accurate. So we don't recommend those. But spin echo EPIs, as we would get in diffusion imaging for B0 images, they're a great thing to get as a blip reversed pair or a set. You might be getting three in one direction and uh, um, three or more in, an, in the opposite direction. As part of the images, we are often going to see a magnitude image, which is going to look like a normal brain image, though not so good quality. But we're also interested in the phase component. And every MR image has a phase component, but we normally throw it away. For field maps, we don't, because actually it contains all the inf interesting information. So if you're ever asked, you know, whether phase is important, yes, it is. For field maps, totally, you have to keep it. And then the phase difference will create something like this, which is actually the 
the proportional to the map of the field. So you can see that it's uniform for most of the brain except in these inferior frontal and temporal areas. We're also going to use a special cost function. So you might have seen this before in the table of cost functions. It's called BBR or boundary based registration. It's very specially formulated to work for structural so EPI registrations. And the idea is that it concentrates on something that we know is reliable. That is the interface between the white matter and the gray matter. Because actually the surface of the gray matter, we can have problems in the EPI and we can actually lose some of the signal and the boundary is not so clear. The boundary between the white matter and the gray matter is normally much more reliable. We extract that from the T1 weighted images and then we map it onto the EPI, or that is we transform it into the EPI space using our registration. And then we look at the change across that boundary. And that's what these yellow points and lines represent. It's a pair of points connected to a line which just represents two values that we're sampling on either side of the boundary. And we're looking for a change across that because we expect the EPI to have a small amount of anatomical contrast in it, but it will be enough that overall, when we average it over all the points in the boundary, we can see something reliable so that when the boundary is in the right place, we get the best change. And so this relies on a couple of assumptions. One, that you have a T1 weighted image that you can get reliable boundaries from. That's normally the case, but you, we must have that. We must make sure that we can get good boundaries. And secondly, that there is some anatomical contrast between gray matter and white matter within the EPI. Now, it doesn't have to be obvious to the eye, but it does have to exist. And there can be situations where that is a problem. And particularly when you've got very high acceleration factors in multiband imaging or simultaneous multi-slice imaging, that can be an issue where you actually lose a lot of that contrast. In that situation, we often use another image such as the SBREF image or the, the pre-saturation image where we're actually taking that image, which we don't normally use for our functional uh, analysis, but we're using it because it has better anatomical contrast. And it's normally something which comes for free. It's normally one of the things that the scanner throws away in order to get to the saturation, but for registration purposes, it's really useful. So you may find yourself in the situation where you need to use that when you're using very highly accelerated multiband imaging sequences. So that's the idea of boundary based registration. It's really just concentrating on what is happening at that interface between the white matter and the gray matter, which also makes it more robust to pathologies which are in the deep white matter or things which are happening outside uh, the surface of the cortex or even further outside. So it's a very useful cost function is definitely what we recommend. In terms of how well distortion correction works, here's an illustration. So in the top row, we've got a structural image with the red edges extracted from it. So it's they're perfectly aligned with the, the grayscale there. And then in the next row, we've we've got to, uh, what we've got is a registration of a functional image or an EPI to the structural image without applying any distortion correction. And then in the bottom one, we've got the same thing, but with distortion correction applied. You can see that at the back of the brain, they're actually very, very similar. There's basically no difference. But if you look at some of these boxes, then you can really see differences. So in the blue boxes, we see how the anatomy is much better aligned when we're actually doing the distortion correction, how the front of the ventricles ends up in the right place, how, how this medial gray matter now ends up in the better place and how some of the sulci are better aligned. But in the yellow box, you can see a case where they both look bad. In neither case does it look like we've got a good alignment. And that's because that's where we've got some signal loss. And so areas of signal loss are not good places to assess how good the registration is. You actually have to learn to ignore those. So this is one thing where you need to understand a little bit about the sort of sequence and the problems with these sequences. Signal loss will occur in the inferior frontal and temporal areas, and those areas, particularly at the edge of the brain, are not good areas to assess whether the registration is working well or not, because we've just lost signal there. So this grayscale image is just stopping at that point, not because there's a bad anatomical alignment, but just because the anatomy that was there, the brain that was there, we didn't get signal from. And so there's nothing that we can do. As I said, signal which is lost is gone forever. 
In terms of setting this up within the feet GUI, then actually it's part of the pre-stats tab rather than the registration because it happens very early in the process in the pipeline. And it's called BNOR unwarping. And what you have to do is you have to give it lots of information. So you have to tell it about the field map that you've got. It needs to be in certain units of radians per second. And that's normally very easy to get from your sequence. And we've actually got a little script which can help if you're on Siemens imaging, but we've got a page which shows you how to do that if you're on a, a different scanner. Basically, it's just converting into radians per second. Maybe you've got it already in Hertz, in which case that's a really easy conversion to do. It's just multiplying by a number. Or maybe you need to actually calculate the difference of the phase images yourself and then turn it into something which is radians per second. These are fairly straightforward things to do, well documented in the wiki. In addition to that, you need to give it the magnitude image. And as I said before, this is the one that looks like a normal brain image, albeit not great quality. We also give it the brain extracted version, but this is a case where we're very picky about the brain extraction. So we actually want the brain extraction to really leave no non-brain material behind because actually the, right at the edge of the brain, we have lots of noise in our field maps. And so we want to get rid of that. And so the best way and the easiest way to do that is just to make sure that our brain extraction is really tight. We don't actually care if the brain extraction is too tight. If it actually starts getting rid of a little bit of the brain at the edge, that's better than leaving non-brain material behind. So sometimes we'll deliberately erode the image and we'll actually shrink it down so that it, it's missing a little bit of the brain in certain areas around the edge. And that's a better thing to do. We also need to tell it about different aspects of the sequences that we've been using. So we need to tell it about the functional EPI sequence. We need to tell it a specific value, which is about the echo spacing or the effective echo spacing. If you know something about how EPI works, then you'll know that that's about the time that it takes for the trajectory to cross the y-axis uh, a couple of different times in succession. And it also takes into account the in-plane acceleration factor, which is what makes it the effective echo spacing. You don't need to know these details, so you don't need to understand that side of things. You can just ask the operator or somebody else who's experienced what that value should be for the sequence that you're using. Whoever has actually designed the sequence and whoever is operating the scanner, they should be able to provide that value for you. We also are going to give it the echo time of our functional image, and that's a fairly well-known value. Again, you can get that from your operator. We also need to specify the direction of the phase encoding. And so normally we can see what that is in terms of the anatomical direction. And again, your operator can specify that for you. And then you need to tell it in within the images that you're working with, which of the image axes is that. And so that's not so bad to figure out whether it's X, Y, or Z. What is hard is to know whether it's plus or minus. And so we normally can't figure that out. There are so many different steps which happen in this chain of converting from DICOM to Nifty and then doing something like the reorientation that it's very hard to predict this accurately. So what we recommend instead is you, the first time you do this, you try both. Try plus and try minus. Look at the results. When you've got it right, it will make things better. When you've got it wrong, it will make things worse. And so that's something which is fairly easy to do. And once you've done that once for one subject within the protocol, it'll be the same for all of the other subjects that you're scanning with the same protocol. So you only need to do it once. And that's something which will also be covered in the practical. We also have a signal loss threshold, and that's basically the number so that if you have more signal loss than this, then it's going to ignore that area. It's set at 10% as default. I've never seen a reason to change it. I've never needed to change it. So just leave it at that. When you do run it in feet, you're actually going to get a whole range of outputs. And again, in the practical exercise, you'll be looking at this. And what you see is that the first one just shows you a color map of the actual field map itself. And so that should be fairly uniform, except in the inferior temporal and frontal areas. Then you'll see a map of the areas which are going to be ignored for signal loss. And again, we, we're expecting red in that area. We don't expect too much of it. If we have too much of the brain being lost, being ignored, then we're going to have bad registration. And if we've got virtually none of it, then that probably means that something has gone wrong as well. So we expect a little bit, something like this. The next one is not so useful. It shows you how much uh, the shift map is, but the color scheme is terrible. So just don't look at that. What is useful to do is to look at the extremes of the color range. 
So if you look at these values, so in this case it's minus 3.6 and plus 4.1, what we would expect, that shows you the maximum amount of shift which is happening in voxels within the brain. And that would normally be somewhere in the range from you know something like 2 or 3 up to something like 20. If it is 20, that doesn't mean that everything is moving by 20. Far from it means that one voxel is probably moving by 20 and everything else is moving you know, by one voxel or less. But it's in the right ballpark. However, if that value is huge, if it's 2,000, then that's a real problem and it would indicate that something's gone wrong. And if it's very small, if it's 0.01, that would also be an indication that something's gone wrong. So this is just a, a good check to see that you're in the, the right ballpark. And things going wrong like that normally means that some of the values, such as the effective echo spacing, haven't been done right, or the field map isn't in the right units of radians per second, or that you've actually put something in in seconds as opposed to milliseconds. Something like that. Units and that kind of thing are normally the cause for these problems. We also show a registration between the field map, or the field map magnitude, and your structural image, because actually now we've got an extra image, we've got a field map image. And so there's an extra stage to our registrations and our pipelines. This one normally works really well. So it's normally a very easy thing just to check this particular um, output and check that, that that looks good. But if that doesn't look good, then that would need to be fixed, that registration. And then finally, you get down to the things you really care about, which is how well has it registered the EPI to the structural? And there are various different things that are shown here. So you've already seen examples of how we've got red edges from one thing and gray scales from another. And we see various different permutations of that. The ones at the bottom are the most important. And in fact, at the very bottom, there's a movie of the registration done with correction and without correction. So we're seeing the gray scale is the EPI, the, the functional image with the red edges from the structural, and we're comparing two different registrations with and without that correction. What's useful there is to look at that sequence and see where are things moving. So if I look here, I can see that actually the brainstem are very obviously moving. There are some parts at the sort of front end of the, the ventricles, they're also moving. The parts which are moving are the things which you're actually going to be able to compare in the ones above. So in the ones above, we've got more detail about the registration which is done with correction at the top and then without correction underneath. And if you look at those same areas that you've identified in the movie as the ones which are changing, that should uh, let you know uh, or let you be able to determine which is the best. So one of those will look better than the other. If you've got everything around the right way and everything is specified correctly, then that should be the one with correction. If it's not, then that is an indication that you've probably got the phasing code sign uh, opposite from what it should be or that something else has gone wrong. This is the point that we would check whether we need plus Y or minus Y, for instance, by, by doing this twice and seeing in which case is the with correction one better than the no correction. You can also load things up in the viewer and look at things in more detail. This is going to be an illustration of what things would look like across various different uh, levels so that you can understand how the various different things that we've been introducing help. So this is a, a registration that we might get of a, of a functional image to a structural image with just standard FLIR and not using the BBR cost function. It doesn't look terrible. Um, but actually, if you compare it to what you would get with BBR, you can see that's actually way worse. So you see a lot of improvement in terms of where things are aligned simply by using BBR on its own. And that's BBR without any field maps at all. So most of the brain is substantially improved just by using BBR. But then we can add field maps. And if you look at the difference with and without field maps, you can see that most of the brain hasn't shifted, which is what we expect, because the field is only distorted in the inferior frontal and temporal areas. And so that's the part which we expect the change. But actually, it shifts all the way up to the front of the ventricles and the medial portion of the gray there, where you can see a substantial improvement with using the field map in this case. We can also look at that in the other three planes. So these are the same three instances. So here's the standard flirt. 
here's what we get by adding BBR. And you can see just the big shift that you get between those, which is fairly typical, because actually the signal loss at the bottom of the brain is what causes standard flirt to go wrong and try and compensate for that by moving it up and down. And then if we add the field map to BBR, then you see most of the brain is the same, but you get substantial improvements in these frontal areas, particularly uh, inferior frontal areas. And so that's the summary of how we do register either functional EPIs or diffusion EPIs to structural images. We really strongly recommend using field maps. It's the best way to get the best registration. We get geometric distortions and signal dropouts using EPIs regardless of what we do. There are things that you can do in acquisition to try and help with that, but you'll always have some degree of these things going on. Using the field maps, we can correct for the geometric distortions and put signal back into the right place when we got signal, but if signal is lost, it's lost forever and we can't fix that. BBR is the cost function we use and it helps enormously just on its own. And so we really strongly recommend that in all cases where you are using EPI to structural registration. And then when you're doing it with field maps and you're correcting for the distortion, look at your results carefully in the areas of distortion. Be aware that they're the inferior frontal and temporal areas, are the things to look at. And don't be put off by the fact that there will be signal loss right at these sort of extreme ends at the edges of the brain, which might make things look bad. Don't use those areas to judge the quality of the registration. Use the areas which are moving but clearly have decent signal left in them as the ways of assessing whether the registration has worked well or not.